Well, we are starting a brand new series this weekend, and I've been excited about it for a while. I, I uh, think it's one of those series that's going to be extremely helpful to you. And I always believe that every series is helpful to you, but sometimes I know that they're helpful in a couple of different ways. Sometimes they can be helpful, but they hurt. You know, I'm talking about when we need surgery spiritually, it still hurts, but it's something that you need. And then there are other times where I believe it gives you something, it gives you a gift that maybe you, to receive it is like a, a breath of fresh air. And so I believe that, that coming into this series that that is what it's going to be, like a breath of fresh air where we're able to see what God can do and will do and that we're able to see in new light how we can leave something behind. We don't have to have it surgically removed, but we can leave it behind and it's going to feel better for you today. Anybody want to feel better when you leave? I think today you can feel better. Half of you want to feel better, the other of you want to be punished. I don't know what's going on. I'll do two different sermons. I'll yell at some of you and I'll tell others of you it's good news, all right? But it's going to be a fun, fun series. We're calling this series Canceled. And how many of you have found that we can cancel almost anything today, right? It is crazy how we can, we can just cancel everything. Um, I, I actually order most everything in our home now comes in Amazon.com box. If y'all are like that, you're helping me support the corrugated materials industry and the box industry. And, uh, and we get lots of things from Amazon. If you can order it from Amazon, we get it from Amazon, you know. And so uh, we, were, we were ordering something from Amazon. And I realized after I ordered it that I didn't actually want it or needed, I don't remember which one it was. There's a fine line between want and need, you know. And so I, I, I just realized I don't really want this or I don't really need this. And so I was like, but you know how Amazon is. You order something and then you like are walking out the door as you push send and then she's, Amazon delivery lady standing at your door when you come out and you're like, how did you know? And she's like, we just know. We know. We know what you want, when you want it, and we get it to you fast. And so I was like, man, this thing's going to be here before and I know it. So I jump into the app to see if I can cancel it. And sure enough, I see that it's already out for delivery. And I'm like, oh, man, I bet I can't. And I'm like, oh, I can still cancel it. So I cancel it. And through some kind of voodoo magic, they are able to send a message to the delivery driver and say, just send that back. We don't care. They don't want it. Just send it. We'll pay for shipping twice. In Amazon like that, have you ever ordered something? You can actually cancel something after you've gotten it. I'm not talking about returning it. That's one thing. I'm talking about canceling it. I, I went in and I said, I want to return this. They said, don't worry about it. Just keep it, burn it, and bury it in the backyard for all we care. We don't care what you do with it. Just don't send it back to us and we'll give you your money back too. I was like, that's when you know a company's making too much money, when they don't even want their returns back. They're like, it costs more money for us to even have it. Just take it. You take it from us. You keep it. And so uh, you can cancel anything. You can cancel doctor's appointments now. You remember a day when you just didn't cancel doctor's appointments? You're like, well, we got to go to the doctor. It's against the law to cancel them. We don't even know what they do to you. But if you cancel a dental appointment, I think they pull all your teeth the next time. I think that's what they do. And so we don't cancel. But we cancel everything now. You can be like the day of and you cancel it. And they're like, well, we're going to charge you your fee for canceling it. And you're like, try. Amazon doesn't do it. You can't do it either. And so you know, we, we, cancel, we cancel time out with friends. It's no big deal now to call somebody and be like, hey, I, I can't make it. And they're like, we're already at the restaurant. I know. I'm sorry, but I'm not coming. You know, we cancel on people, cancel reservations, cancel things that we're doing. We cancel all kinds of stuff. And so we cancel appointments and all those things. And on convenience items, this is pretty great, right? I mean, convenience items, this has worked out well for us. But in areas of our lives where it probably sometimes is a little more inconvenient, it's actually starting to be troublesome that we have this cancel culture that we live in. And do you all agree with that? We are in a cancel culture, aren't we? Everybody on three say cancel culture, just to say it out loud, because I like to make you say things out loud. Cancel culture. One, two, three. Oh, you did so much better than the last experience. You're on your game. You did great. I had to make them repeat the class. It had to, we had to go back and remedial it a little, just a little bit and teach them how to do it. Cancel. Cancel culture. And our items, uh, you know, uh, where, where we, we want to cancel them because we don't want to get them, it's one thing. But we also aren't just canceling reservations with friends. We're canceling friends at an alarming rate. In fact, we're canceling friends faster than we can actually make them. Uh, that's what uh, sociologists tell us. I'm actually reading a book right now that's talking about the fact that we're losing connection in so many ways. And one of the things we do is we cancel friends faster than we can make them now. And you know it takes time to make friends. Like it takes time to build friendships. But we cancel them so quickly that we don't have time to make new friends. 
We don't even have the replacement friends anymore lined up. And so we're finding ourselves alone. We cancel friends now. We cancel. I've seen this in the generation that we live in now. I think that it's always been waves of this, but I really feel like even for my generation, I'm 47, I'm not that old, but I'm not that young anymore either. I'm kind of right in the middle, right? And um, I found with my generation, we had this respect for authority. Like, we didn't always agree with authority, but we had this respect for authority. But now our generation it, that's before us is, is for canceling authority at every level. Now, now, let me say, many authorities have done things that have been cancelable. And, and that's part of the reason why. But there's not this just a, a, a ability to kind of respect authority. We cancel the authorities in our lives. We, we cancel people that we know and love. We used to fight for people that we know and love. Now we cancel them. We cancel people that we don't know at all and don't love at all. I mean, we, we have people in our lives that we don't even know their story. We've never met them before, but we cancel them online. We, we can't, they can't even be heard of anymore online. And, and I was thinking about this cancel culture that we live in. When a lot of us grew up, like if you made a mistake as a 17-year-old, you, you weren't, it was Okay. Because everybody knew you were 17. And when you were 47, no one was going to bring up what you did when you were 17. Right? I mean, are anybody else in their 40s just grateful that all the things you did in high school have been forgotten forever? There was no Facebook to record it on. There was no Wide World Web to record it on. There was nothing. It's just gone. And we're so old now that we don't even remember what people did. Like we're, I can't even remember what I did last week, much less what somebody did when I was in high school. Like, I, they're like, people, you come up to me all the time, you're like, you remember me? I'm like, no. We've both gained weight, gotten old, we look different. Like, no, I don't remember you. They're like, we went to high school together. I'm like, I went to high school with 300 people. I don't know but two of them. One of them I married. All right? And so, so you're not one of them probably because I can't even remember my child's name sometimes. But we, we've forgotten that. And here's the deal. When I'm 47, no one's holding against me what I did when I was 17. But now we cancel people for what they did when they were teens. I, and I'm not making judgment on any politics or any Supreme Court stuff or anything. I'm just saying when you're in your 50s and 60s, you don't want to be reminded of what 17-year-old Sean did, Right? Because here's the deal, I'd love to go back and just slap 17-year-old Sean. I'd love to go back and tell him some things. I'd love to work him over just a little bit and say, hey, don't do that. Don't do, hey, when you're 27, you're going to make this decision, don't do it. But we don't get to do that. But we also haven't, weren't held to that judgment and that cancellation. So I feel for our generation now. Everything they're doing is being recorded. Every word they're saying, every stupid retweet, re-Instagram post, all that stuff, it's all being recorded now. And we cancel people, anything that they do. And so anytime there's this cultural tide, we live in this cancel culture. And if a cultural tide is rolling in, one of the things I always want to do as your pastor is to be able to see how does that cultural trend stack up against the Bible. For example, let me give you a positive example of a time when culture, I believe, has pushed the church into good directions. In my lifetime, I have seen the church change radically to what I believe is a more biblical response to things because culture pushed us, but we held it up to Scripture and said, wait a minute, this is what Scripture really teaches, but in the area of how women are treated. Even just decades ago, the church was not synonymous with equality when it came to gender. It was not, it was not like, hey, women have a voice at the table. And so a lot of times men were sitting around tables by themselves, probably tables that Jesus would have flipped, but were sitting around tables by themselves and never allowing women to come in, even though the Apostle Paul had really pushed against this a lot when he said there's no longer any Jew or Gentile or slave or free, male or female, for you are all in Christ Jesus. You're one in Christ Jesus, Paul had said in the Scriptures. I think we got that Scripture for you. And so when Paul had said that, that was something that we were able to see that was being pushed by, but the church had not responded to that. So then when culture began to push women into areas of equality and we started to see CFOs who were women and CEOs who were women and women who were starting organizations and starting businesses and running businesses, the church had to go, all right, wait a minute, this is a cultural trend, but how do we believe about it as a Bible, as we square it up against the Bible? And so we read things like what Paul said. And we read about what God feels about people in general and about leadership and about the home. And we read those things and we said, wait a minute, I think we can be pushed by this tide into a good direction that's actually biblical. 
And so that's the job of a pastor. That's the job of a believer, really, is to go, where is culture pushing up against me? And is it, is it a good thing? Because it lines up with scripture or is it a bad thing? And so I tell you, I'm proud to be a part of a church who is, has women in leadership and women in roles where we can hear from them and that we see the diversity and thought that comes with different people and different folks bringing different things to the table. And that has been a positive way that we line it up against the scripture and that we have found that there is something beautiful that happens when culture and scripture push into the same direction because beautiful things can begin to come into play. However, in the same way, there are times when culturally we see things as believers, as a pastor, and we compare them to Scripture and go, this is where the culture is pushing us. But this is not something as we line it up against Scripture and what God would say, that we are able to find God in this cultural trend. And over the last few months, as I've been reading about, hearing, witnessing this cancel culture, I have compared it up against God, and what I have found is that God loves people. And if God loves people, he doesn't cancel people. In fact, God doesn't cancel people. The only thing he cancels is sin and shame. And so as a culture, we need to really watch what we're doing. And so, so we live now in this cancel culture. Now, before you believe for just even a moment that I think in any way the party, the color of the party that you voted for determines whether you, which side of cancel culture you're on, don't even come at me with that. Because here's what I've seen. We live in a counter-cancel culture. And both sides, all right, well, we're going to cancel them because they don't believe what we believe. And then the other side, oh, you're going to cancel one of ours? Well, we're going to boycott something of yours. Oh, well, this company's going to take a stand on that, so we're going to cancel them. Wait a minute, what are we taking a stand on? The fact that they cancel people. So we're canceling people who cancel people. Do you see the vicious cycle that it can become? I cancel you, well, I'm going to cancel you back. Well, I'll cancel your friend, then I'll cancel your friend. I'll cancel you what you believe in. And we're just canceling all over the place while all the time God is going, I don't cancel, I redeem. I don't cancel, I grow and I cultivate and I bring new th old dead things to life. God doesn't put things to death except for sin. What God brings us is resurrection in people. And what we find all throughout the Bible is that every time someone makes a mistake, there's this beautiful word that is offered, and that is grace. Oh man, if our Bible characters had to live in a cancel culture. If, if, if our Bible characters that we, re, we revere and love so much and learn from so much didn't have Jesus looking at Peter going, hey, I could cancel you, but I'm not going to cancel you. I'm actually going to cancel that debt that is on your life right now. But you're going to actually, I'm going to cultivate you. You're actually going to lead my church. A cancel culture where there's no grace. There's no forgiveness. There's not even the ability anymore, and I don't want to just rail on our current culture because I want to give you the antidote to it. But there's not even the ability now to find common ground among some of the most ardent areas of disagreement that we used to have. We used to be able to go, okay, we disagree, but we're still friends. We're still friends. We can disagree and still be friends. We can disagree on really important subjects and still be friends. Definitely we can disagree on the most important subjects and still be friendly. Like, we don't have to be friends to be friendly. Like, but, we, but now we're enemies of anybody that disagrees with us. Simply put, if you do not agree with me, I cancel you. If you hurt me, I cancel you. If you disagree with something that I believe in, I cancel you. I cancel you if you make a mistake, even if we would call it sin. I cancel you. I cancel you. So, so here's what's happening. It's, it's the long tail of like what's going on right now. The residual effect of what's happening and seems funny on the surface, but really it's not funny at all. It's hurting people. And that is, is that we are canceling marriages at alarming rates, absolutely alarming. We, we are canceling friendships, as I said, faster than we can make them. We, we, there's been, we've canceled out church. I hear people all the time saying, well, I, just, I don't have anything to do with church. Hashtag church hurt, church hurt. You know what I think about church hurt? Let me tell you what I think about church hurt. We could rename it hurt. Because you know what we live with? Humans. You know what humans do? They hurt people. First two letters of human, H-U. Then you put an R and a T on it, hurt. Humans hurt. You know why we hurt? Because we've been hurt. And people who have been hurt, hurt people. And so when you talk about canceling out, I just canceled church in my life. 
I'll just get my content off the internet. Content's not church, by the way. If you're joining us online right, right now, I love that you're joining us online right now. And I know that you have a story. And I know that there's a reason. But can I tell you that my hope for you, my hope for you is that as soon as you have humanly possible to, you will be back in the body of Christ. Because if not, because content is not church. So we cancel out church. We, we cancel out organizations. We, I mean, pretty soon we won't even be able to eat because it will be like we've canceled everybody that makes food. And we, I, what do you do? I starve. That's what I do. I just starve because I... I don't know what else to do. I can't eat anything. I can't eat anything because we've canceled all the companies. And so we're just canceling, canceling, canceling. And what's sad is that we're canceling community. It's really what happens. Because eventually if you play this little survivor game where you vote everybody off the island, you're going to be the only one left. And if your standard is they have to agree with me on everything in every area of my life, they have to parent like I parent, they have to eat like I eat, they have to be politics like I do politics, they have to believe everything theologically that I believe exactly the way I believe it, even though you're probably wrong on 50% of your theology, right? We're not going to get to heaven. God's going to be like, dude, I learned from you. Like, it was amazing, like, how good you were at theology. Study of God. That's what theology means. You studied me like no one else. No, we're going to get to heaven. He's going to be like, oh, it was a good try, but let me show you. Let me show you. And so we're holding the standard. And eventually, if your standard is so high that you cancel anybody that doesn't run with your standard, you find yourself alone and isolated. And so like no other time in the world, we had the most humans on the earth that we've ever had in the history of the world, and yet we're as isolated as we've ever been. We are as connected as we've ever been. I can know things about you instantly, and yet we are so alone and don't really know or are not known by anyone, so what we're really canceling is community. Genesis 37 teaches us about this, and I want to go into the Bible story now to kind of learn what the antidote to all of this is. And this is where the sermon really takes a turn, because I believe this is going to show you something that is going to give you fresh breath to breathe today, because the cancel culture is so, so hazardous to our soul. And when we're breathing in that cancel culture, that cancel culture, it's like a cancer to our lungs. But today I want to give you some fresh breath. It's going to fill your lungs again with pneuma, the breath of God, the spirit of God, I believe, is getting ready to come upon you. So here it is. We're introduced to Joseph in Genesis chapter 37. And Joseph lived in some cancel culture, y'all. I love this story of Joseph. If you've been here for any time at all, you've heard me preach on the story of Joseph several times. And Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. He was also daddy's boy. Like he was daddy's, he wasn't quite his baby. He had one younger brother, but he was definitely daddy's boy. And Joseph, he did the things that like younger brothers do. He would tattle on his big 10 older brothers like all the time. And he would tattle on them and go back to dad and tell him stuff. And this earned him some, you know, a seat with Jacob, his dad. And Jacob loved to show him how much he loved him. He definitely loved him the most. And he gave him this gift. One time he gave him a robe. A robe was really significant of, of the power of the family in the Bible. And so he, would give it, he gave him this robe, but it wasn't just a, a normal robe. It was like a blinged out, unbelievable robe. Like he was just strutting around in his robe. Like he knew this was a special. It's a robe of many colors. You heard it called that. And so it was an extravagant robe. It was an amazing robe. And so he is strutting around, and, and it's, it's an incredible time for him, but his ten brothers begin to hate him. Like they, they're like, this guy goes and tattles on us. He gets all the good stuff. He got the robe from dad. He gets dad's attention. Everything he does, dad is like, oh, isn't Joseph so awesome? Isn't Joseph so great? Did y'all have that younger sibling, by the way, that the, the parents were always like, oh, if you could just be like so-and-so. They're just so awesome. They're so great. And so, and you're like, you just had them later in life, and you were older, and you were better at raising them. You were too young when you raised me. And so... You, it's your fault, mom, dad. That's why I sit on a seat like twice a month to kind of work through all of these things with a counselor. It's because of you. And uh, that's a whole other sermon. So his ten brothers are getting mad. Genesis 37 verse 5. It says, one night Joseph had a dream. He wants to go and tell his brothers about his dream. Now, there's nothing really wrong with all that. That's okay. But when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Ooh, what did he tell them? Joseph, what did, well, how did you handle this? And so verse 6 says, listen to this dream, Joseph said. We were out in a field, it's fine, tying up bundles of grain. It's a weird dream, but it's okay. We tie up bundles of grain. That's what they did in this agrarian culture. Suddenly, Joseph says, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around 
and bowed low before mine. It's like Dale Carnegie, how to make friends and influence people right here, man. Joseph has given us a lesson. How to make your brothers not give you a swirly anymore. No, actually, this is how to make your brothers give you a swirly every single day. As you go to them and tell them that their bundles of grain are going to bow low. You're going to bow low to me. And his brothers responded with, so you think you're going to be our king, do you? They're like, what are you thinking? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and they, the way that he talked about them. Soon, Joseph had another dream. Oh, good, the brothers are thinking. Joseph has another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream. And they're like, yay, great. What happened this time, Joseph? The sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowed down low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he said. Well, your mother and I... And your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? Now, back in 2020, I actually preached the scripture and we looked at Joseph's dream. And, and in your Bibles, if you go, you'll see the header there um, is above the, the passage that we're reading. It actually probably says in your Bible something about Joseph's dream. Now, you know, the headings that are in your Bible, the chapter numbers, the, the verse numbers were added by the editors of the Bible, not by Holy Spirit who inspired them or not by the writers of the Bible. But it's something that just makes it easier for us to follow along and find things in the Bible. And so they added those. But they also added headers to the Bible. So they added these headers, and in your Bible, it probably rightly calls this, because obviously it is, Joseph's dream. Or, you know, talks about Joseph had a dream, or Joseph tells his brothers his dream, but it concentrates on the dream. But the last time I preached about this in 2020, actually while I was preaching, it's amazing what happens while I'm preaching, because I see everything, by the way, like I, I see all the things that are going on, and, and I think about things that are happening, and God tends to, to speak to me, and sometimes I will go off script, and I'll just be like, Holy Spirit's telling me to say this. But in that moment, I was preaching, I noticed this about this story, something that I really hadn't noticed that much before, because the headers of the Bible don't point us into this direction. Just reading the Bible like and not really thinking it through doesn't necessarily point us in this direction. But Holy Spirit illuminated something to me. And here's what I noticed. I don't know that we can just call this Joseph's dream. It actually is Joseph's dream. And so definitely can look at that part of the scripture and preach that part of the scripture. But the other thing that we can call it is Joseph's big mistake. You're like, wait a minute. What, what, what are you talking about mistake? I thought God gave him a dream. He did. That is true. This is a dream from God. I'm not questioning that it was a dream from God. I'm not questioning that God knew exactly what was going to happen. It was preparing Joseph for what was going to happen in his life. He knew the mistakes that Joseph was going to make. He knew when Joseph was going to repent. He knew everything that Joseph was going to do. And so he was preparing him in spite of himself. He was preparing him. But when I look at this, I see Joseph made a mistake. It's not about the dream necessarily that was from God. But what I'm talking about is what Joseph did with it. You see, sometimes God is going to give you something. He's going to give you a dream. And when he gives you that dream or when he gives you that word or when he gives you that instruction or when he gives you that conviction, it might not be time for you to share that with other people yet. How many of you know there's still moments that we just need to have intimate moments with our Savior? He wants to work on your heart, but that doesn't mean he's sending you out to be the one who works on everybody else's heart right in that moment. And so when I'm looking at this in Joseph, what I'm seeing is that Joseph did get a dream from God. God spoke and it was perfect, but how Joseph handled it wasn't perfect. It was what he did with it. God will give us all kinds of things. Do you know that God gave you your personality? It's a gift. I know that some people have told you, oh, you're too much, or you're too little, or you're not enough, or you're too wild, or you're not wild enough, or you, you make too much noise, you laugh too much, you make everything funny, or you're not funny at all, you don't even get the office, and you should, and there are two types of people in the world, people who get the office and people who aren't intelligent. And so, like, you're like, you know, th this is like how you feel about things. And so you're seeing this, and you're seeing that there's all these different kind of plans that Joseph had, and that... God is trying to, to work through Joseph. He's trying to show him something. He's, he's trying to, to, to show him that the personality that he gave him, the gift that he gave him, all these things that he gave him, is something that he wants to do for him. And so God will give you this gift of your personality. He gives you this gift. 
And yet, what can you do with that? You can do so good with your personality, right? For those of you who are like, like wild, crazy, always fun, you can be so much fun until we have to be on a group project at school with you. And then we're like, oh, no. Because they're not going to do anything. I'm going to do everything. I, I was that guy in school. I was like, great, I'm doing the whole group project by myself because these, these morons aren't going to show up with anything. They're not going to show up with anything at all. They're going to they're gonna have fun, though. We're going to have fun the whole time. whole time we have fun. For some of you, you're, you're wired up like me. You're wired up to lead. And so you're intense. Your personality is intense. You don't do anything that's not intense. You talk intense. You do everything intense. Connie tells me, she's like, you're on the phone. You don't have to yell. They can actually hear you through the phone. They don't have to hear you physically where they are. Because I'm intense. I have intense phone conversations. I lead intensely. But, but people who are wired up like me tend to lead well. And our personality is given. But here's the other thing that we can do. Here, here's what Joseph did. Joseph mishandled his brother's emotions. And he mishandled the gift that God had given him that was supposed to be intimate with them. And so I remember one time when Twitter first came out. Uh, you guys are on Instagram and stuff. You probably don't even remember Twitter. You're like, what was, what was Twitter? Like it was, it was the gram of today at one point, right? We were all on Twitter. And when Twitter first came out like 11, 12 years ago, I was sharing everything. Like, like, I mean, I was like, look, look at my food. Like who cares? Like, you know, look at my food that I'm eating. Look where I'm going. Look at this. Look at my new, look at that, look at that. And it was just novelty, right? Everybody was sharing everything. And I remember one time um, I came home and like I was going to tell Connie about my day. And she was like, I know. I know everything you're going to tell me. I'm like, what do you mean? How do you know? You are there. She's like, you put it all on Twitter. All I got to do is follow you on Twitter. I know everything you're doing, dude. She's like, and then she's like, actually, like in this moment, like we were, I think we were actually out on a date night. I think we were out on a date night at some point. She's like, hey, can this moment just be ours? And like it was an important lesson for me to learn, like about sharing things all. Because she was like, hey, I want there to still be some things that are just us. Like in an intimate relationship, we actually still should have some things that are just ours. Like that happened, we laughed about it, but no one else has to know. We, we laughed, we told a story, and we actually, it, it would be great to tell, but you don't have to tell everybody. Now she knows they'll all turn up in a sermon at some point. Like she knows, she knows that. But they don't have to be shared instantly. We can just, we can just, we can just share this moment together. And I think God was saying to Joseph, hey, I got something for you. I got something for you. And it's just for you and me. And one day it's going to be useful. You know, he's like, hey, take this, take this class. Sometimes God's taking you through a class, and one day it's going to be useful. But you don't have to go share it with everybody. Else. Sometimes God's trying to just to cultivate something in you. And he's going to give you a passion and a purpose, and you don't have to go share it. And, and Joseph, his big mistake, Joseph made this mistake, and the mistake was is he mishandled his brother's emotions. We can mishandle our personalities. So that same leader who is intense and likes things to be exactly how they should be, it makes for a place that runs well, a company that runs well, that, that and can give critique and that can correct things, but they can also be hazardous if they mishandle the gift that God has given them. If they mishandle the emotions. That person who's the life of the party is incredible. Like you can't take that to a funeral, right? You can't take that to when someone's mourning and grieving. And so you got to know how to not mishandle your emotions. And so if a friend is in a funeral moment in their life, they're grieving, they're mourning a loss that they had. Maybe not even of a person, but they're mourning a loss. And all you want to do is make fun of it and make jokes about it and go, hey, let's get back to having fun. You mishandle their emotions. And so Joseph, he, he mishandles the emotions of his brothers, his brothers were hurt. And so it's easy for us, really easy for us to get on jo the Joseph side of the story. And it's easy because his brothers make it easy. Their response is terrible. It's awful. We're going to look at it in a moment. But I want us to start back at Joseph's mistake because I want you to see that even when people are hurting you, there probably is a genesis of it where they were hurt themselves. And, and Joseph's brothers or hearing this from Joseph, and I imagine he delivered it with a little bit of an attitude. He's got his robe on. He's kind of strutting around just a little bit. He's telling them how I had this dream. Guess where you were in the dream? You weren't standing up. You were bowing down to me. He was like, get low, get low, get low. He's <laughs> like, that's what you're going to do. And so Joseph mishandled 
the emotions of his brother. And so I just want to take you back to that moment because I don't want to minimize the hurt that you have. Because here, I'm putting all my cards on the table. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do at the end of this service. And, you're gonna, and I think God's going to move in your life. There's somebody you need to forgive. There's somebody that you need to offer grace to. Not to cancel, but to offer grace to. And, and here's the thing with Joseph. I don't want to minimize the hurt that you've gotten. Because I don't want to minimize the hurt of his brothers. The sin, the pain, it was real. And Joseph's brothers, it was, it was real for them and it was, it was real for you. But I also want to show you a diametrically opposed response in Scripture that his father had in verse 11. Verse 11 of the story says, but while his brothers were jealous of Joseph. Say while. While, see, while it's happening, you have a choice to make. While you're getting angry and you can feel the anger, while you're getting sad and you can feel the sadness, while, you, while it's happening, you have a choice to make. But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father did something different. He wondered what the dreams meant. Do not miss this. You have a choice to make. I know you say, they hurt me. They may have done something that hurt you, but you get to decide how much they hurt you. You are the only one in charge of your emotions. You are the only one in charge of how you feel about something. You say, I am so angry at them. They made me angry. They didn't make you angry. You chose to be angry at something that they did. You are in charge of how angry you get. Oh, but they sent me in, that choice they made sent me into a depression. No, you get to decide if somebody else will affect my life or will I say, no, God, you're the only one who can meet my needs. You're the only one who can affect my emotions. You're the only one who can strengthen my faith. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not an easy choice to make it. And almost every day I fail at making this choice and I succeed at it. But we've got to make the choice. The choice that he made, Jacob, was between grace or grudge. And in, in that moment, I see Jacob as a dad. And I love that I see Jacob as a dad because I also want to see my father, my heavenly father, as a dad. And I think that there was just a moment where Jacob was like, oh. if you have teenagers, you've had this moment. Joseph was a teenager where you just go, oh. the other day, Izzy had something online. Like something that she put online, and Connie and I, being 47, don't always understand what 15-year-olds do online. And so we try, we try to stay up on that. We want to be woke, you know, that kind of deal. <laughs> so Connie was like, hey, mom, I mean, was like, Izzy, what does this mean? Like, what does this mean? Like, what, what's going on here? Like, what does that mean? And she looked at her mama, and she said, if you know, you know. <laughs> and I was like, here's the deal. Here's the deal. <laughs> Here's the deal. I'm fixing to know about something. I'm fixing to know about a 15-year-old who doesn't have an iPhone anymore. <laughs> She's really good. She's really good. Now she said, if you know, you know. If you know, you know. I think that's like a hashtag. I, if, Y, you, K, Y, K. Somebody say it out loud that can say it. You must be under 17. If you can say that, if you know that and can say, if like when I was going there, if you were like, I already know this, and you're over 30, get off the gram a little bit, all right? If you already knew that, just get off just a little bit because I don't know any of that. So anyway, we talked to her about what it meant and all that kind of stuff. And she's like, if you know, that's what Joseph was doing in this moment. You know that Jacob had to be like, dude, what do you, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean by this dream? And Joseph was like, if you know, you know. And Jacob was like, son, I will teach you what I know about something. I will. No, no, no. He, he's like, all right. And that's what Connie did. She was like, all right. Hey, so I'm going to ask again. Like, what is this? You, sometimes you just got to push in. You know, you just got to push in with teens. You just got to push in. And, and that's what Jacob did. But you, you know that we need, that was grace. You get, we give teens a lot of grace. When we had our youth takeover and the, the teens were on stage and they were leading in worship and they were, they were anxious to lead in front of you guys and they did an incredible job. It was amazing. But they were anxious and they were talking about like how anxious they were. And I was like, hey, here's the deal. Adults give teenagers so much grace. Why? Because we know y'all don't know what you're doing. Like we know. <laughs> we know. So we give you grace. But can I tell you something about you, 50-year-old man? You don't know what you're doing. And, and, and can I tell you about your wife? She doesn't know what she's doing. She's still trying to figure out how to be a wife. 
Can I tell you something about the, the, the boss that you have that you're like, oh, he ought to know by now. If, if you know, you know. He ought to know by now. He doesn't know. He's still trying to figure it out, especially this last year. You're like, oh, I don't like some of the decisions my boss has made in the last year. Give the man or woman a break. Like, what in the, they, didn't, they didn't know which way was up the last year, much less how to figure out a policy for COVID. Good grief. Like, like, what's go, like give them some grace of what's going on in a moment. Just be like, oh, I'll give you some grace. And so that's what J, J, uh, Jacob did. He's like, it's okay to sigh, by the way. I think that's a moment that we get from God. God doesn't sigh at us, but we get a moment. Like, we get to go, just sigh. And then Jacob, Jacob sighed, and then he said, I wonder what that dream meant. Do you see how he got past the delivery and he got to what was being delivered? Mm, gosh, I'm bad at that. Can I just confess just for a moment? I know you're not a priest and I don't need one, but can I just confess how bad I am at that? Getting, getting past the delivery. Somebody will come to me with something that did I legitimately probably in, the, in retrospect start to think, oh, that was probably from God. But when they're really poor at delivering it, I won't receive it. And I wonder if sometimes if we could just get past the delivery of it and just receive what God's trying to deliver to us. Just what, what we, he wants us to receive from him. And Jacob did that. He said, wait a minute. His delivery wasn't spot on. He's got some work to do, but he is 17. And so I'm going to give him some grace on that. But I wonder what those dreams meant. My, my friend, she came to me. She told me that that attitude didn't look good on me. But the way she told me, it kind of hurt my feelings. And then I got caught up in my feelings. And so since I'm all up in my feelings, I didn't even get a chance to stretch my faith because I didn't really hear what she was actually saying. I wonder if sometimes our kids can deliver things to us as parents. Oh, my goodness. Now that I've got, you know, a little bit older where they've got some, they really do have some things they can point out. But they don't know quite how to deliver it. So all I'm saying is I wonder how many times you have judged someone as hurting you when they were actually trying to help you. I wonder how many times they've said something that would have taken you on a journey towards your faith, but you've allowed it to stir up something that was fear, and so you, you didn't receive it. And, and so Jacob, he receives it. I, I want us to see that because he had this choice. Jacob's brothers, they got offended and canceled Joseph. Or, I mean, Joseph's brothers, they got offended and canceled him, but Jacob chose grace. He considered the person that they were human. Part of our culture and what we live in right now with the way that we are so connected is we have dehumanized people to the degree that we, we, just, we use them as bits in jokes. We use them as opportunities to laugh at hashtag fails. And I mean, I'm, I do it too. I'm not, don't, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not pushing down on that. I don't do anything. They're funny. Somebody falls skateboarding. You can't make me laugh any harder than that. I mean, just, you know. But we've dehumanized people, haven't we? We've dehumanized them. And what, I think what Jacob was really teaching us here when you choose grace over grudge is that you, you, you let them be a human again. That's what God allows us to do is to be human human sin. So what did God do? He came up with a way to forgive, cancel sin. And so he let them be human again. Have you ever, have you ever just had a bad day? Like really, a really bad day? Like you're like, I had a bad day. Like you ready to sing the song type of bad day? Just cry in your car before you go inside, you know? I had a bad day. I wonder if, wonder if maybe the person who hurt you just had a bad day. That's what Jacob was doing. He was just considering. My boy's 17. I probably babied him a little bit. I gave him that robe. That probably wasn't a good idea. He's just considering how he made some mistakes along the way. He's considering who Joseph really is, what he should. He considered him. And in that, he chose grace over grudge. And, and we choose grudge a lot, don't we? I'm talking about Facebook. So there's this, there, the other day I was watching this thing. There's this guy. Have you ever seen a Facebook fight break out? Like a real Facebook fight where you're like, just eating popcorn, like watching your cousins who are newly married, like fight online. And you're like, why, why are they fighting online? You're like, I don't, but I, I, for some reason I want to watch it. Like you're just, you're drawn to it, right? And um, so there's this guy who watches these Facebook fights and then he makes songs out of them. Talking about a grudge, I wanted you to see this because I thought it would just make you laugh for a minute. Let's watch it. Talking about it, my be from Carolina. 
<laughs> Eight years is a long time to hold a broccoli casserole recipe stealing grudge. I, that is a long time to be that I, You've gotten into a territory where it's no longer grace or grudge. It's grudge or psychotic at that point. Like you, I mean, who even knows? Who, who even knows whose recipe it was? Who even cares whose recipe it was? You've got something deep down inside. Grace or grudge. And Joseph had 23 years that are going to follow where he has the opportunity to build a grudge. And what I, want, what I want for you is that you would choose not to build the grudge. That you would choose grace over grudge. Because here's what I've learned through it all. You may cancel a person but you stay subscribed to the bitterness. I, people are canceling people right and left, but have you noticed they gotta tell us they're canceling them? They gotta tell us they're canceling them like every other day? Why? Because they, have you ever filled out one of those deals where you try to get like a, 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 a trial to something, and so you give them your email address, and then you're hammering, you're trying to, and you cancel the, tr the trial. You're like, no, nah, I, I don't want the product. But then you can't get them to stop sending you emails no matter what you do. You're like, I mean, is this one of those cases where, where we talk to a senator? Like, what do we do? Like, what, do we call the FBI? I don't know what to do. And because they just keep sending you emails. Can I just tell you, unforgiveness and grudges is like that. You may cancel the person, but they, you get a fresh email every single day of bitterness. Because you can cancel the person, but you didn't cancel all the hurt. And here's why. Here's why. Because every time you cancel the person, but the problem still shows up. And, and the, the problem is actually in you. It's called unforgiveness. It's unforgiveness. Look, look at what the grudge can do. So when the Ishmaelites who were Midianite traders came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him. And so the next 23 years of Joseph's life is he's a slave to Potiphar. He begins to rise up in the ranks, but then Potiphar's wife accuses him of sexual assault because she likes him, but he doesn't return her advances. And so he gets canceled again. He gets sent to prison. While he's in prison, he starts interpreting people's dreams, and they're like, hey, that's a pretty cool thing that you can do there. One of the guys gets out of prison because of that and says he'll come back to get Joseph, but he doesn't. He cancels him again, doesn't even care about him at all. And so then, but he's working for Pharaoh one day, and Pharaoh's like got a dream that he can't kind of get worked out in his mind. It's like two years later. He's like, oh, oh yeah, I remember this guy Joseph back in prison who really does a good job with dreams. I think his God like helps him do that. And so he comes, he interprets the dreams for Pharaoh correctly. And so then he starts to rise in the ranks and Pharaoh says, hey, I need to get your advice on some other things. And one of the dreams was this. He said, there's going to be seven years of famine and seven years of feast and then seven years of famine, Pharaoh, or, or Joseph tells Pharaoh, so you should prepare, like you should be making a lot of broccoli casserole for a little while. Uh, you should prepare. And then one day you're going to eat it all because there's going to be famine. And then he becomes the CFO, the chief financial officer of Egypt because of all of this that he sees. And then one day the famine gets so bad that their, their people have to come. In fact, one group of people known as the Israelites, who, who were the people of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come. And they have to bow down to this leader of Egypt to ask him for food. And they realize, we recognize this guy. Or he, real, he recognizes them first, actually. He's like, I recognize these people. I know who these people are. And so they come down asking him for food. And in Genesis 43, after 23 years, his brothers are in front of him. And he gets a choice. He gets to make the choice. Eight years of a grudge, 23 years of a grudge, or grace. And in verse 2 of 45, in Genesis 45, it says this, And Joseph, he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. And then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, Hey, I'm your brother, Joseph the one you sold into slavery in Egypt. You remember me? He, he hadn't quite forgotten it all. Hey, does that remind me? You don't have to forget it to forgive. Joseph still remembered what they had done to him. And now 
He says, listen to this. This is so beautiful. Do not be distressed because you know they just realized the guy that their life depends on, the, the guy who has the power to kill them in an instant or to just send them away with no food and kill them over time, is their brother who they threw into a well and then sold into slavery. And he says, and now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves. What a gift. When you forgive someone, you also are giving them the freedom to not, to forgive, to, to forgive themselves. You say, he says, hey, forgive yourself. I know that, I know that you think I'm going to be angry. Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. It all comes, Joseph's like, oh, that's, oh, I see it now. I see the dream now, and I see what it meant now. And it wasn't time to share it then, but now it's time to share it. And I love this moment because Joseph, it tells us he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. Why was Joseph weeping? I think he was weeping. The Bible doesn't really tell us everything. It lets us kind of put the pieces together sometimes. I think the reason he was weeping because he realized he was getting to see his brothers again. He realized that he was going to be able to ask them about his dad. He was going to get to see his dad again. What he thought was lost was now found. What he thought had, was completely dead was now being resurrected. He, he had this moment. And that's what unforgiveness does. See, he could have been bitter. And if he had been bitter, it says that bitterness is a root that will take in us. And in that moment, he would have just killed them, canceled them. But he had already worked through some things. Obviously, he's weeping. And it shows me that Joseph was ready not just to forgive, but to live again. And he says, hey, what you meant for evil, he tells them in verse 50, late, just a few chapters later, he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Now listen, what that's not saying, what you did was right. Hmm. You meant it for evil. You meant to cause me harm when you threw me in that well. You meant to cause me harm when you sold me into slavery. I'm not, as, as we say that we're, when we forgive people, we feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're making it right what they did. No, no, we're just letting them off the hook. They deserved to die. They deserved punishment. I know somebody else who deserved punishment. I know somebody else who deserved to die. And God said, but if you'll bring them to me, I'll forgive you. If you'll bring it to me, I'll, I'll, I will show you what true living looks like. And so Joseph is really modeling for us, grace or grudge, grace or grudge. And today I want to advocate for you letting go of the unforgiveness. It's not hurting anybody but yourself. Who have you canceled but are still subscribed to the bitterness in your life over? Today. Not through a process. Today, forgive them. The process of continuing to forgive them, yeah, that's going to come. But today, decide, I'm going to forgive them. Because here's the deal. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself and waiting for the other person to die. It doesn't work. Who are you canceling that you actually should consider? So, God is saying, I want you to forgive. There's some of you on the other side of this. You've been canceled. I've had people cancel me before. You've been canceled. And I just want to leave this with you. I think this is something God's given me for somebody in this place. Just because people cancel you doesn't mean that your God dream is canceled. Just because Joseph's brothers tried to cancel him, there was nothing that could stand in what God wanted for him. And there's nothing that will stand in front of. So you may have been canceled today, just walking new confidence and going, hey, I'm, and hey, you're hurting because of that. So hurt people, hurt people, don't hurt people. Decide today that even in my pain, what my parents did to me, what my ex-spouse did to me, what my friends have done to me, whatever, what that authority in my life did to me, even in spite of my pain, I'm not going to walk forward in pain and hurt other people. Hmm. Gosh, what could happen? if we just forgave. God, would you allow us today to forgive 
You've put people on our minds. God, you've showed us a picture of what it looks like to live in forgiveness with them in this story of Joseph. And today we want to say to them, what you meant for evil, God has made for good. What you intended for evil, God has made it good.